peace. Can you put peace in your own heart? According to Joel Osteen, you can, but he's a liar. And it's sad that people like him are filling the pulpits in America. Can you put patience in your own heart? No. You can try to practice it, but the Holy Spirit's not using you and working through you and doing these things in you. You're just pretending. You have to have the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. It's the Holy Spirit that does it. It's His work. We work in tandem with Him, but He's the one that starts the process. He's the one that helps it all the way along, and He's the one that finishes it. Just like planting in your garden. You might go by the seed. You might put the seed in the ground. But you don't sit there and make that seed sprout the first little leaf that comes up. You don't make that seed shoot out its first root. That's God's job. And then God makes that plant grow. Yeah, you might water it from time to time. God makes the plant have the ability to grow. Without God, it's not even going to grow. And then, do you go out there and say, okay, plant, now it's time to make fruit. Now, I want a tomato. And, and concentrate real hard on the plant. No. God is the one that makes the flower bud. He sends the bees to pollinate it, and He makes the tomato grow, and then you pick it and eat it. But God did all most of the work in that scenario and in that situation. And it's the same way in our heart. We cooperate with God. We cooperate with the Holy Spirit. But if we don't work in tandem with God, then all of a sudden everything falls apart and it doesn't work. Here's the problem with America today. A lot of people quench the Spirit of God. And when the Spirit moves and starts to talk to them about stuff that they're uncomfortable with, they say, oh no, no I don't want to listen to that. I mean, I've been in churches where the Spirit's moving and preachers are preaching about conviction and people say, yeah, and they literally get up and instead of coming down to the aisle, they walk out the back door because they don't want to hear what God has to say to them. They don't want to hear that there's something in their life that needs to be changed. They don't want to hear that God loves them so much that He wants to change that with His power but they say, no, I don't want to hear it, and they take off. That's one of the ways that we can tell if somebody's quenching the Spirit, if they're not listening. If they're more concerned with things that are not important and they're less concerned with actually obeying God, there's a big problem. And in our bulletin, the verse last week was out of, uh, was out of Proverbs. It was Proverbs 1.7. If you have your Bibles, you can go there. Proverbs is an interesting book of the Bible because it has all these different um, Proverbs in them that people would memorize and they would learn. And some of them seem contradictory sometimes, but the more you think about them, the more they make sense. And this one is one my dad used to say to me all the time when I was a kid. Proverbs 1-7, Fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. Here's the thing. This is saying that unless you have fear of the Lord, you can't have any kind of wisdom. And I've literally heard pastors say, well, we're Christians. We don't really fear the Lord. You know, we love the Lord. And, and He loves us and everything's cool. But you know what? The Bible says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And this work, who's the one that gave these guys all this word? It was Jesus in his pre-incarnate form, speaking to these prophets, speaking to these wise men, saying, write this down. This has got to go in the book. And he's speaking, and he hasn't changed. And Jesus, when he came, he said, fear God, not men. Fear God who can throw you into hell and destroy you. Don't fear men who can't do, do anything but kill you. Fear God more than that. That was what Jesus had to say. He didn't change his message. It was the same message, forwards and backwards. But a lot of times people say, well, I don't need to be afraid of God. Yes, we need to be afraid of God. We talked about that a couple weeks ago, how two guys went before God. One of them, he said, well done, my good and faithful servant. You did this and this and this and this and this. And, and he was like, I don't remember doing any of that stuff. 
And the other guy said, hey, I did this and this and this and this and this. And Jesus says, depart from me. Worker of iniquity, I never even knew you. And here Paul's saying that there are people that engage in a lot of this stuff that says they will not inherit the kingdom of God. And you know what? We're going to get to heaven, and it's sad, but I think it's true. We're, and, and probably all, every Christian in, in the world is going to experience this. We're going to get to heaven, and we'll see people departing. And we're like, wait a minute. That's brother so-and-so. Why is he going to hell? There's sister, whoever. Where is she going? You know, because it was part of that whole facade thing. And we don't want to be amongst that group. We want to be in the group that says, yes, Holy Spirit, do whatever you want to do with me. Take complete control of my life. If I end up sounding crazy to my friends and family, that's okay. I'm going to follow you no matter what. That's what God's Spirit does a lot of times. I've been reading this book. Trevor just finished it. She gave it to me. It's by a Jewish rabbi who became a Christian. And he said, it's really hard to be a Jew and become a Christian because your whole family basically turns their back on you and shuns you. And you're no longer welcome in the family at all. A lot of them, you know, Gentiles, you know, if you become a Christian, you might have some buddies that say, oh, you're not fun anymore. But you're not going to be totally shunned by everybody in your community, necessarily. In fact, you come to church and you're usually brought into a new community. But in the Jewish world, especially up until the late 70s and the, and the early 80s, there weren't any Jewish churches for you to go to. So you were just, you know, by yourself. And you didn't really feel comfortable with all the Gentiles in, in their churches. But you couldn't go to synagogue anymore. What do you do? And that's why Jewish churches have sprung up all over the place. And Jews converting to Christianity is one of the biggest things right now on the rise that kind of show us that we're in that end time period. A lot of people say, well, maybe we're not there yet. Just read, you ought to read this guy's book and read how many Jews are coming to know Jesus, which was a prophecy that it wasn't going to happen until the end time started. And yet it's happening. And it's happening. And it's happening even more. Another thing, though, that's a big deal about quenching the Spirit, and it goes back to wisdom, is people don't want to understand things of the Bible. They don't want to understand God's Word. They look at salvation, like we talked about last week, and they say, well, I don't get that. You know, or they look at prophecy, and they say, well, that doesn't make any sense to me. And they let it go at that. You know what? If somebody has the Spirit of God working in them, they're going to understand things. The sad thing is, you got people on the radio, people on TV that are preaching all the time a whole bunch of nonsense that isn't even true and, and taking out things out of the Bible and saying this is what it means. And it's like, that's not what it says. And they're confused. And then they're confusing other people. And they just make it worse and worse and worse. But they get popular, but they still have no understanding because they don't have the Spirit of God moving in. Sadly, you can kind of pick just about anybody on TV now. And that's the state. And it, and it really is a sad, sad situation and a sad commentary on religion in America today. Another problem, and another way that you know that the spirit is being quenched in America, is unity is not easily attained. Everybody seems to have their own opinion and they want to do things their own way, but in a spirit-filled church, Everyone has the same direction, the same focus, the same mission, and behind a spirit-filled leader who is leading them closer and closer to Christ. See, St. Augustine talked about, in the City of God, uh, which is one of his books, he talked about the Christian path is like a big spiral that, that's like a coil that gets tighter and tighter as it goes up. And God's up here, but the spiral starts out real big, and it gets... Tighter and tighter and tighter and tighter. But as you're on the path, and you're over here, and this guy's over here, as you move closer to God, all of a sudden you move closer to each other in proximity. And so a lot of times people come into a church, and church people are like, well, look at them. Look how they're dressed. Or look at this. Or look at that. And it's like, that's not... 
That's not spirit filled. See, if somebody with the spirit says, Praise God, that person came to church. And man, I remember when they were like this. And oh, look, look, they went down and got saved. Oh, look, they're getting baptized. Oh, look, look at what God's doing. Now, now they're leading the Bible study. And look how wonderful, what the awesome change that God did in their life. And a lot of people, if they're really following the Spirit, they get excited like a parent when their kid takes the first steps. But if they don't have the Spirit, they look back and say, look at all these kind of people that are coming into our church now. And that's not right. That shows you the dichotomy between somebody that has the Spirit and somebody that doesn't. Somebody has the Spirit, they're excited when people become more and more like Jesus, when they get closer to God. If they don't have the Spirit, they're just put off that their country club is getting changed up. And that's not what God wants. But that causes a division. And that means the unity can't be attained. You know, in Ephesians, and you can go there if you want to, this is in verse 4, it says, For there is one body and one Spirit, just as you have been called to one glorious hope for the future. For there is one body and one Spirit. And you know, churches today divide over the silliest things. They divide over the color of the carpet. They divide over what color to paint the walls. They divide over, you know, many, many, many things. Some of them are dividing over gifts. Well, hey, I got this gift. And no, I got this gift. And this gift's more important. No, that one's more important. Who cares? They all come from what? The same Spirit, where there is one body and there is one Spirit. If we have the Spirit, we are united and we're one. But if we don't, we're divided. Then he says later in verse 13, this will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son, that we will be mature in the Lord Measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Have we arrived yet? No. But as we get more and more like God, we will eventually arrive. And He will change us. He will make us like Him. One of the last things I want to talk about, though, is a big one. And I don't know how you are today, but I know some people feel this way, a church that's quenching the Spirit is a church that is full of fear. Fear is something that we have to give over to God. It's easy to look at all the things that are happening in the world and go, oh, what am I going to do? But if we follow God and we let His Spirit work in our hearts, then all of a sudden, we have more fear of God than we do of anything else in the world. And so when the world throws everything they got at us, we say, what else you got? That didn't faze me. I lost everything already, so it doesn't really matter. I, 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 don't, I have all that I need because I've got Jesus living in me. I don't need money. I don't need fame. I don't need, you know, my family. I don't need my television. I don't need this. I don't need that because I've got the one thing that I really need, and that's Jesus. I want to show you something. Some people have come to me and they've said, really scoff and mock and said, you know what? They've been saying for years that it's the end times. And, you know, we don't really know that it is. I'm going to prove it to you today with just a little bit. Honey, would you go back there and fire that up? There are things that have happened in this world that the Bible specifically says are not going to happen until the end comes. One of them is that the Jews would be returned to Israel. That's a big one. We talked about that a little, a little bit. But I want you to go in your Bibles. There are literally tons of passages that you could go to. I want to give you two, and maybe three of them. But then the Bible says in the mouth of two or three witnesses, an order of a thing is established. And I want to show you what's going on in the world today. But I want you to go to Hosea. There are four things that happen when God brings judgment to a nation or to a country or to a world. And the four things are this. It first starts with animal deaths. Then plagues and pestilence follow. 
Then when all the food supply is gone, famine hits, and then the last thing, everybody goes to war because they've got nothing to eat. That's a pattern. We're going to talk about the first one. This is found in Hosea 4. I'm going to give you verses 1 through 3. It says, Hear the word of the Lord, O people of Israel. The Lord has brought charges against you, saying there is no faithfulness, no kindness, no knowledge of God in your land. And you make vows and break them. You kill and steal and commit adultery. There is violence everywhere. One murder after another. And this is the key part. That is why your land is in mourning and everyone is wasting away. Even the animals, the birds of the sky, and the fish of the sea are disappearing. I want you to go to Jeremiah 12, 1 through 5. I want you to keep in mind that he's saying, well, the world is wasting away because of the violence and the killing and the stealing and the breaking of vows, the committing of adultery, the murdering, and he says, this is why your land is in mourning and everyone's wasting away. Even the wild animals, the birds of the sky, and the fish of the sea are disappearing. Why? Because it's a judgment from God. Go to Jeremiah 12. Jeremiah is another prophet. It had noticed this exact same thing when God brings judgment on people. Zephaniah is one. You can go there sometime. Amos talks about it. But we're going to look at Jeremiah 12. This is starting in verse 1. Lord, you always give me justice when I bring a case before you, so let me bring you this complaint. Why are the wicked so prosperous? Why are evil people so happy? You have planted them and they have taken root and prospered. Your name is on their lips, but you are far from their hearts. Those are non-spirit-filled people. But as for me, Lord, you know my heart. You see me and test my thoughts. Drag these people away like sheep to be butchered. Set them aside to be slaughtered. How long must this land mourn? Even the grass in the fields have withered. The wild animals and the birds have disappeared because of the evil in the land. For the people have said, the Lord doesn't see what's ahead of us. That's scoffing. That's that, well, God doesn't know. You know, I met a people that were in school, in seminary, and they had a professor that says, well, Prophecy is just sort of a maybe. God doesn't really know what's going to happen because we have free will and everything gets to... God knows 100% what's going to happen all the time. That's God. He's that omnipotent. But people don't necessarily believe it. But I'm telling you, it's happening. I want to show you something. Go all the way to the bottom, honey. In 2010 is when I noticed this. And if you go on the internet and you start searching this stuff out, it's really hard to find this stuff before 2010. Sure, you can find some die-offs, but most of the die-offs that happened before 2010, you can look up the articles, and they've got an explanation for why it happened. But, starting at the end of 2010, things got a little weird. In November of 2010, thousands of seabirds dropped dead in Tasmania, Australia, and nobody cared. They thought, well... You know, it happens sometimes. Then in December, in, uh, in Western Australia, thousands more crows, pigeons, and waddles, and honey eaters fell out of the sky. They didn't park and then fall over and die. They're just flying along and then boom, crash, which is really weird. This is where I noticed this. In January of 2011, on the first day of January, you probably remember reading about this, 5,000 blackbirds and starlings fell out of the sky. I remember watching the news, and a guy had a snow shovel, and he's shoveling up dead birds by the buckets full. And just, they asked the scientists, what happened? And the scientists said, we don't know. Then about a year later, they said, it must have been fireworks. You know, it's the first of the year. People were shooting off fireworks, and it killed the birds. But every other city in America was shooting off fireworks that night, and there were thousands of dead birds laying in their yard, and the scientists still don't know what killed them, even after doing autopsies. You're going to find, when you look at the articles, over and over and over again, they say, unknown cause, unknown cause. It's a mystery. We don't know why this happened. On and on. Scroll on up, honey. This is the list. Not only 
were birds, but fish, thousand fish, hold on. Back it up. Well, we'll leave it here. Thousands of fish die in a lake that turned blood red. Massive dead fish found in the Haihe River in North China. Fish washing up dead on shores in North Falmouth, USA. Sea turtles turning sick and dying off in Australia. Hundreds of fish dead in the Rio Grande. Keep going on. This is September. Millions of bees mysteriously dying. Ten tons. Ten tons of fish dead and gone. Keep going. Thousands of dead fish in Vietnam. 300 fish. Canada, 3,000 fish in England, 500 songbirds, millions of fish killed by red tide. These are the titles, and these are all links to articles you can go to and read about. Thousands of chickens died, 25 ponies dead in Australia, 17,000 chickens. This is 2011. There's about 100 and some different events that happened in 2011, but I want you to look at 2012. Look at this. Thousands of tons of herring wash up dead. Can you blow that picture up? I want you to look at this. Have you ever seen that many dead fish laying on the beach? It just doesn't happen. Last time I went to the beach, we built a sand castle. I didn't have all those dead fish laying there. Go on back when it's going down. There were... 465 known events in 2012 in 67 different countries. Scroll up. 150,000 birds in Bangladesh. 230 tons in China. 3,000 in Nepal. 300,000 of fish in China. Tens of thousands in China. China's losing a lot of fish. Thousands of squid. 300,000 ducks. Keep going. Just, just scroll through the list. Look at this. Just, just look at the list. Look at some of the pictures. I, I just want you to get an idea. Well, these are the starlings. Go back to that. This was in Missouri. That's not very far. But look at that. The whole ground is just littered with these things. Boom. Fallen dead, out of the sky. They don't know why. 90% of the time they say, well, who knows? Whales. Whales are washing up in record numbers. Beaching all over the world, and people say, well, it's global warming. Well, who's in charge of that? It says in my Bible that God is in control of every bit of it. Shrink it, honey. Okay. Just, I just want you to look at this list. We're only in October, and we're still going back. 25 dead beehives. Cattle and buffalo. I mean, these are all sorts of animals all over the place. We just saw a mass death of, of hammerhead sharks in Hawaii. Just on and on and on and on and on. Scroll all the way down through it, though, and then let's show them 2013. Just look how long it takes to get through this list. This is May. Go on to the next one. This is 2013. 798. Now, I want you to understand, we're not talking about 798 fish. We're talking about 798 events where thousands of fish are dead. Thousands of birds are dead. And the Bible says that God knows when every single sparrow falls out of the sky. Do you think He doesn't know about the 50,000 dead fish in China? Or he doesn't know about all the blackbirds that dropped dead in B.B. Arkansas. He knows about every one of them. In fact, he handcrafted every single one of them. And yet they're dead and he's allowing them to die. thousand plus dolphins washed up dead in America. 4,000 chickens died. Keep going. Just scroll through this list. It's ridiculous how long this is. In fact, we were at Pizza Hut a while back. And I'm sitting there scrolling through the list on my phone, and it's taken forever just to go through the list. And the lady comes up and she says, what are you looking at? Millions of dead bees. And I said, oh, I'm looking at the, all the dead animals that are dying. Have you heard about this? And she was like, no. And I said, look at this. You can't even get through the list, and this is just this year. All right, and that was like, I don't know, that must have been September of last year. 
Look at all these dead sheep. Boom, they just drop over dead, and the scientists are baffled. Sometimes they have an answer, but most of the time their answers are crazy, like the firecrackers that killed everything. Firecrackers didn't kill all those birds, I hate to tell them that. The other thing that's interesting is you read these articles, and people will say, it was really weird. We saw the bird flying by, and then he started flying really erratically, like he got lost or something, and then he just dropped dead. I've read that several times about this. One time, I think it was in Finland, a thousand tons of fish wash up on the beach. The scientists get called. They come out to study it. The tide come in and wash them all back out before the scientists could even get one fish to look at. It's just, but the Bible says, I'll give you one more verse. Revelation 8. Let's go back there for a minute. I'm not making this stuff up. This is just, it's really happening. It says, uh, the first angel blew a trumpet and hail and fire mixed with blood were thrown down on the earth. One third of the earth was set on fire. One third of the trees were burned. One third of all grass was burned. And the second angel blew a trumpet and a great mountain of fire was thrown into the sea. One third of the water in the sea became blood. One third of all living things in the sea died. One third of all the ships in the sea were destroyed. I'm not saying that the tribulation has started, but if this ain't a warning that it's coming, man, I don't know what is that. They're dead. Dead. All that. 400 tons of dead fish. Yeah, maybe they did something wrong. I don't know. But that kind of stuff was never reported before. That's the kind of stuff that's new. All these dead horses in Oklahoma. I've heard about buffaloes up in Wisconsin and, and, and cattle. They just... On and on and on. Shrink it out, man. Just, it's just this year, this last year was ridiculous. This is May. Get on down to the end because I want to go to next year. Look how long this is. And, and, and every single one of these has a link to the newspaper article you can read. But this year alone, we're just getting started in this year. And we have 50 that have already happened in 21 countries. Real good start of the year, and here we are only a couple weeks in. A thousand ducks dead in South Korea. Eleven sea lions. Five thousand three hundred dead fish in Illinois, Clinton Lake. That's not that far from here. Hundreds of turtles in India. Hundreds of ducks in Indonesia. Seven dolphins. Two sea lions and a whale. Thirteen whales. I'm telling you. Something's going on. And it started before all that pollution got dumped in Japan. You know, when the nuclear reactor went down. Something's happening. Eagles. Let's look at the bald eagles here. Wait, look at bats. Yeah, 100,000 bats in Australia. 40 bald eagles now dead. Now I want to tell you something. What happens after the animals die? Plague, pestilence, and plague. What causes pestilence and plague. Insects a lot of times, and mice. What eats insects and mice? Bats, some bees, birds. But God says that's the first to go, the birds and the fish, the things that actually eat these things that cause pestilence and plague. And then the second thing that comes as a judgment upon a land is pestilence and plague. But I want to prove to you, this, this is from an end time site. So you can look at that and say, well, he's nuts. He's some whacked out Christian. And I don't agree with this guy's theology at all. I've read through his thing and he's absolutely wrong about most stuff. But at least he's keeping track of all these things. And he doesn't get them all. I found some that he misses. But this is CNN. They noticed they've got a list of different ones. This is one from the second year after the BB Arkansas incident where a bunch of birds died. But the Huffington Post, going over to that one, is a ridiculous liberal rag. But when I type in Bible and dead animals, the Huffington Post is one of the first ones to pop up. Of course, they're saying it's all because we're destroying the world. But even in Revelation, it says God will punish those who destroy the world. So another sign of the end. But scroll down through this list and just look at what the Huffington Post has put up. I mean, bottlenose dolphins. And they talk about the whales. 
They talk about the starfish. But here, if we really have global warming, and all the ice caps are melting, and the oceans are getting fuller, don't you think the animals should be thriving in that kind of a condition? Because it would be adding more oxygen into the water. But no, they're all dying. 20 bald eagles, dead. Manatees. Just, they're saying it's from red tide. Red tide's from toxic algae. 813. I'm telling you, folks, we are getting crucially close to something that's going to happen in America. God is coming, and He's tired of people playing church. He's tired of people saying, well, as long as they just show up, it's cool. He wants your heart. He wants 100%. He doesn't want 10%. He doesn't want 20%. He doesn't want 30%. He wants it all. 100% of your heart submitted to Him. And saying, yes, God, I don't care what it is. I don't care if i got to go to the cross like you went to the cross. I'm going there. I'm giving it all to you no matter what. Ezekiel tells us in 21.7, he says it's terrifying when God's judgment comes. He says, when they ask why you are groaning, tell them I groan because of the terrifying news I have heard. When it comes true, the boldest heart will melt with fear. All strength will disappear and every spirit will faint. Strong knees will become as weak as water. And the Sovereign Lord says, it is coming, it is on its way. But here's the thing, now that I've scared you half to death, I want to give you the good news. God says in 2 Timothy 1.7, For God has not given us a spirit of fear and timidity, but of power and love and self-discipline. Who's he talking to here? A lot of Christians quote that verse. Paul's talking to Timothy. Two spirit-filled, God-loving, 100% sold-out guys talking back and forth in their letters. And he says, us. He hasn't given us a spirit of fear. If you have the Holy Spirit in your heart, then you can stand up against anything and say, my God is bigger than that. My God has every single one of those fish in the palm of His hands. I'm not afraid that all these fish are dying. I used to be. And I asked God, I said, I can't take this. I don't want to live in the end times. And finally, God got through with me, through my heart. And He started filling me with Himself. Here's what happened. My dad and my uncle, well, several uncles, are well -dwellers. A lot of people think, well, you can only contain so much of the Spirit. You only contain so much like a cup. God pours in the Spirit, and that's it. That's not the truth. The truth is, we're more like wells. God scoops out a little bit, and the water comes in. I would watch my uncle. I mean, I've been on several well drills before. And they bring up, I mean, the well drilling rig goes deep. And they would start to cut in, and they would say, um, hey, we hit water. And my uncle would look down, and he would say, no, go deeper. And I said, John, how can we stop? I mean, you got water there. And he says, that's a spring. It'll go dry real quick. Another time we hit water. John, how can we stop? That layer of water is not that good. We want to get down to the good stuff. We're going down to the bedrock. And you go 200, 300, sometimes up to 500 feet deep, these wells would go. And then they'd get down to the water. And John would tell me, there is a literal lake in Indiana and Ohio that spans out pretty much from Indianapolis all the way over to Columbus and from, uh, I think, Fort Wayne, all the way down to the Ohio River. It's an underground lake. And he said, if we can punch down into that, their well never is going to go dry. Now, I want to tell you something. You are like that. I'm like that. The deeper we go with God, the more filled we get. And we dig deeper with God. And we dig deeper with God. And how do we dig deeper? We study His Word. Yes, 
We pray, yes, but we can't quench His Spirit. Because the Spirit is the one that's drilling the well. It would be like me telling John, okay, we'll drill this well, but get the rig out of the way. Alright? You know, the rig's just blocking up the hole. You know, I want to get down in that well. If I did that, it'd kill me. My cousin almost fell down a well the other day. Thank God he didn't, his ladder broke, and he didn't die. And my dad and my brother were able to pull him out. But those wells are deep. The rig has to drill the well. Just like the Holy Spirit has to drill the well in our life. Jesus is our example. And Jesus didn't let fear overtake him. In fact, Isaiah says this about him. It says, the Spirit of the Lord will rest on him. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding. The Spirit of counsel and might. The Spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. Jesus looked spent his life under Roman occupation, saw tons of crucifixions, and even at that, even though he was afraid, he was in the garden, and he said, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will. And he went boldly to that cross, and he hung there to pay for our sins. He hung there to pay for our sins, and also to give us the Holy Spirit that would come into our lives and change us completely. The Spirit gives us power. The Spirit sanctifies us. The Spirit heals us. The Spirit does all sorts of stuff. And I'm not talking necessarily about gifts. If He gives you a gift, praise God. I'm happy for that. But your gift is Him. He is the big gift that you can give. Don't give up when things get scary or when things get crazy and you think, I don't know what's going on in the world. Don't let those things shake you. Dig deep into God. Let Him well up in you. It doesn't matter how bad it gets. Alex Jones will tell us, go buy guns. Glenn Beck's saying, go buy food and gold. A lot of people are saying that stuff. You know, the Bible says that the gold in the end times will be trampled on because it will be worthless. None of that stuff's going to save us. And maybe it's good to have a backpack with some stuff in it or whatever in case there's a disaster, a good medical kit. I'm not talking against that stuff, but what I'm saying is without the Holy Spirit, you can have everything else and it can all be going in a vapor in an instant. The Holy Spirit is the one thing that's indispensable. He's the one thing that we can't get by in these crazy times that are ahead. Please, I can't give you an altar call and just give you the Holy Spirit. It's something you got to go home and spend some time seeking Him. Submitting to Him. Surrendering to Him. Over and over and over and over again until finally you're just filled with Him. It's a process. Yeah, it can start at the moment, Paul. It can start, but it's got to continue on.